Good morning, and welcome to Men of the Word, a men's ministry of Calvary Chapel Heartland in Fort Valley, Georgia. Our church is located about three miles west of Interstate 75 at exit 142 on Georgia Highway 96. I'm Greg Cannington, and I'm your host. If you've not been with us before, here at Calvary Chapel, we study the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, all in context, because we believe it's the whole counsel of God contained in both the Old and New Testaments is what we absolutely need. It's our sole doctrine, the Bible, the Word of God. Three of our weekly ministries are Bible studies, which are also available on YouTube and Facebook page. So if you're watching this today, this is one of the Men of the Word. The others are our Sunday service with Pastor Jerry Axtell, currently in the book of Acts, and Wednesday evening at uh, 6.30 with Pastor Phil Snyder, and we're about to start the book of Deuteronomy. So you see, both Old and New Testaments are covered, and today it'll be New Testament. In addition to what you're seeing now, if you're watching, we just finished uh, an in-person Men of the Word study that begins at 6.30 a.m. before people go to work. A group of men meet at the Chick-fil-A on Watson Boulevard in Centerville, Georgia. So it's the same study. For those who can't make it, and we always invite you, if you're able or in the area, to come by and uh, worship with us and study with us. If you can't or you miss a study, you can always catch up on our YouTube channel or Facebook page. We have other in-person ministries, uh, which includes our Misfit Student Ministry for middle and high schoolers. Friday evenings with Paul and Jenna Berger. And there's an evening Men of the Word, Tuesday evenings, on the second and fourth Tuesday with Pastor Aaron. And in uh, the first part of June, we'll begin a new study in Second Chronicles. The ladies have a first and third Tuesday Bible study, which is... Uh, one in the morning and one in the evening. Now, right now, they just finished up, and they'll pick it back up in the end of, uh, beginning of the fall. Regardless, just go to our website, and you'll see all our activities and all our ministries online and any coming events. But before we begin, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we lift up to this study to you, Father. We thank you for this time together where we can study the truth, the truth in your word and pray, Lord. We pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us today and lead us to understanding the deeper meanings of your word and thereby we may enter into a closer, closer personal relationship with you, the Father, and your Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. We give you, Lord, all the glory. And in Jesus, the Lamb of God's name, we pray. Amen. If you were with us last week in our study of 1 Corinthians, Paul's uh, epistle or letter to the church he founded in Corinth, we, only, we studied the first 34 verses in chapter 15. And in that study, the Apostle Paul spoke to the Corinthians, making it clear that the risen Christ, the resurrected Christ, is our hope. And if Christ did not arise from the dead, what hope have we? And our preaching would be futile at best. The resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone of what it means to be a Christian. So join me now as we finish out this wonderful chapter in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 15 as we pick up 
with verse 35 where the Apostle Paul speaks of the glorious resurrected body that each believer will receive and the final victory over death. Verse 35, Paul writes, But someone will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Now, isn't it funny that we humans always want to know the hows, the whens, don't we? When is this going to happen? How does God do this? So if God's doing the work, isn't it enough to have faith in it's God and let Him decide? Sure, we're going to want to know, because that's natural. But let us not question it. If God is doing a work, have faith that His work will be in His will. That should be good enough for all believers. But we're imperfect, aren't we? All of us. Paul continues, Foolish one, what you sow, S-O-W, is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed his own body. Now Paul is about is kind of making a parallel here, comparing uh, something that would be familiar to anyone in those days, 2,000 years ago, sowing seeds. The seed goes into the ground, does it not die, but it grows up into a new plant, into something entirely different, such as a, a stalk of wheat from one seed. So he continues, and you will get his point here in a moment, he says in verse 39, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind, flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. He continues, and it might seem a little confusing, but bear with it, and I think you'll see the outcome here. He writes in verse 40, There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of terrestrial is another, and is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another. Now he draws all these examples into a conclusion, and he explains the resurrection of the dead. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption and is raised in incorruption. The body, when it dies, goes into corruption. You, you uh, decompose. But the raising of the body is raised in incorruption, pure, perfect. He goes on to say in verse 43, it is sown in dishonor and it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, our human frailties, but is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. And the last Adam, meaning Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. So you see, he describes all these sorts of bodies. First, the body has to die, be going into the ground, but is raised incorruptible. So if you, as he expounds on the resurrection, 
first earlier in chapter 15 with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but the resurrection of the believers. Very important. And he explains why this is a key factor. Verse 46, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and then afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. That's us. And as is the heavenly man, meaning Jesus, so also are those who are heavenly. So the natural man are the first man, Adam. When he fell from grace and brought sin sin into the world, he was made from the dust of the ground, the Bible says in Genesis. Jesus, who came from heaven, was put into the ground, but he was resurrected. So you see how these two things are coming along? Earlier in chapter 15 last week, we talked. Paul talk, wrote about the resurrection of Christ and how it's important. And if there is no resurrection of Christ, there is no resurrection for those who believe. And we're all in folly. So he explains in detail here to the Corinthians exactly what he's talking about. And there's a reason for all of it. We're not equipped in our natural bodies for a life of eternity. We're not fit for heaven, really, because we will be made like Christ. And he explains. Verse 49 as we have borne the image of man, of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, Jesus. So our resurrected bodies will bear the image of Jesus. We'll be made like Jesus in the scripture. is full of explanations about this. There's an order in God's plan. Is there not? Our bodies must be sowed, S-O-W-E-D, into the dust to be raised up in the image of our heavenly man, Jesus the Christ. And now come the reason. Our final victory. Paul writes in verse 50, Now I... This I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And that's what he's saying. Our fleshly bodies have no place in heaven in the kingdom of God. That's why it's necessary for Christ to come, pay for our sins, and rise from the dead to bring us into heaven with him. And we need new bodies. I'm nearly 70 years old, and I, my body is wearing down. Certainly not going to be for an eternity, thank God. God has a better plan. Paul continues in verse 54, So when this incorruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then it shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. 
Now Paul was paraphrasing what the prophet Isaiah wrote about 700 years or so earlier in Isaiah 25, verse 8. And Isaiah is referring to God. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe all away tears from all faces. And that's great evidence of resurrection in the Old Testament, which some denied. And apparently some in Corinth were denying it. Yet, no matter what the Sadducees, who only believed the first five books of Moses, they didn't read the prophets. So here it is, once again, another example of the resurrection of the dead in the Old Testament. And there's more. And what he wrote on about it, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll all be changed, raised incorruptible, the dead, that speaks of the rapture, which is an English word, but it isn't written such in our, uh, but it is described in the Greek, arpazo, and in the Latin Vulgate was translated from the root word rapio, which means caught up, snatched away. And Paul explains this again in more details later in another epistle, the first epistle to the Thessalonians in chapter 4, verses 15 through 17, which is the most often quoted. He continues by quoting yet another scripture. Verse 55, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Now that's a Paul continues with the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The law tells you when you sinned. He says in verse fifty seven, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what he just said, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Paul's prayer. Uh, paraphrasing the prophet Hosea, chapter 13, verse 14, which reads, Yet another promise of resurrection from the Old Testament. And this has to do with, uh, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. This is God speaking through the prophet. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, God says, I will be your plagues. O oh, grave, I will be your destructions. Pity is hidden from my eyes, the Lord God says. So this is more evidence given of the resurrection. What's so important in all of this, and why it's so important to study both the Old and the New Testaments, they fit each other like a glove, like a dovetail joint. The promises of God through his holy prophets, the promises of Jesus in the Gospels, the explanations in the rest of the uh, New Testament, like this uh, epistle to the Corinthian church explains it all. It ties them all together. And there's no denying it. And then if you're like me and you enjoy reading Paul's epistles, and I certainly everyone should, he always makes a case of evidence. He provides the evidence. He gives examples. He ties them together, wraps it up, just like he was an attorney in a trial court, stacking up the evidence and the evidence and the evidence, which he just did. Now Paul gives an exhortation. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, 
immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Does it not tie together? The resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of the believers to a body immortal. It's all laid out very clearly. And there really can be no doubt. The evidence is there. Friends, if you have not accepted Jesus yet as your Savior, do so now. This is the most important decision you will ever make because it's eternal. God has given believers in Jesus Christ grace and the free gift of eternal life with Him in heaven. And no one deserves it. We can't earn it. There is no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ. But God will freely give you this grace to all that accept what His Son did on that cross, believing that He is the long-awaited Messiah, Son of the living God. And all it takes is a simple prayer, accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, repenting of your sins and acknowledge that Jesus has ransomed you paying your sin debt, granting you God's promise of eternal life by believing in your heart that He is exactly who He says He is. And if that's you, welcome to the kingdom of God. And you will inherit that immortal, incorruptible body someday. And it might be tomorrow. So don't wait. If you accepted Jesus as your Savior, find yourself a Bible teaching church and grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ because it's a journey. Thanks and a shout out to my brother Kyle behind the camera who does the recording, editing, and putting our video ministries on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. And please join us next week as we, men of the Word, close out our journey through 1 Corinthians with chapter 16, where the Apostle Paul gives some instructions, exhortations, greetings, and farewells. And I will also include a preview to the next book, 2 Corinthians. So until we meet again, as men of the word, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you in his tender mercy. Cut. I finished without you. I'm coming to end it. <laughs> Unless you already did. Huh? I said I'm coming to end it if you didn't already. Well, I said cut, so when I say cut, that's it. Yeah. Uh, I discovered a critter in the wall while we were recording. The what?